person, your neighbor told you about it, uh, word of mouth is the best. So that's fabulous. A uh, long time customer. Ooh, I love growing tomatoes. So maybe you can share some of your tips with us today. And Claudia, hello from fellow Silver Springer. Uh, Bowie, Maryland, something of a beginner. This talk is going to be perfect for you. Huntington, uh, yay, found this on Washington Gardener's Facebook. And looks like we're live over to Facebook. So hello, everybody on fa Facebook. Ooh, Hyattsville. I was just watching a TV special in Hyattsville in Severna Park. Yay. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. So huh, looks like we are ready for tomato season now. I'm going to take off this shawl because I don't think I need it. I think we're warmed up enough. And um, let's dive into our talk today. So I'm Kathy Jentz. I'm editor and publisher of Washington Gardener Magazine. We're all about local gardening in DC, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, a little bit of Pennsylvania, a little bit of West Virginia, and a little bit of uh, some of the surrounding states there. So I'll show you one of our back issues just to show you that we were in print and we've switched to a full digital format now so if, when you subscribe to washington gardener you get it monthly as a pdf file to your inbox when you subscribe and i'll have my contact information and social media and uh, that sort of information at the end of the talk but first we want to talk tomatoes so anytime you have a question during this talk or a comment just pop it in the chat and I'm going to stop about halfway through to take those um, questions and comments and also from the anybody who's watching over live on Facebook and then we'll have some question and comment period again at the end. Um, so feel free to type in anytime as it occurs to you. All right, so we're talking about growing great tomatoes, not just ho-hum tomatoes, but great tomatoes, right, today. And thank you, Homestead Gardens, for sponsoring us. So our first picture here is my harvest um, from, I think this was like the second week of September last year. Um, so we kind of made this fun ombre plate of our different cherry sized tomatoes that we were growing. Um, so we have apple yellow, sun gold, and then uh, early resilient, a red cherry. And we'll talk some more about varieties later in the talk. But first, we're going to talk about growing basics and then troubleshoot some of our common problems. And then after the question break, we'll talk about my favorite varieties and some of your favorite varieties too. So first tomato growing basics, I recommend getting a soil test and Homestead Gardens at their info desk has soil test kits that you can pick up and then get results back. So you can know what amendments your soil needs to grow great tomatoes. And um, I highly recommend that if you are growing in the ground or in a raised bed to do that soil test just as a starting point for you. Uh, the next thing you might want to invest in is a soil thermometer. So the reason the soil temperature is so important is in the springtime when you want to plant out your tomato seedlings, you need to know the soil temperature, not the air temperature. Air temperature matters a little bit, but what the roots are going to grow in and expand in is the most important and the soil temperature needs to be 60 degrees consistently for tomato plants to start to expand their roots into the surrounding soil. So that just happened. I just checked on one of the local agricultural website for farmers uh, a couple days ago for us here in Maryland, DC and Northern Virginia. So we just reached that point. So this is perfect timing for this talk tonight. Um, so you can get out there and start planting your seedlings um, this weekend. And uh, if you plant it early, you could do harm to the plant by sitting it down in too cold soil. Sometimes what it does is it just stops the growth point at that and then it just once it's warm enough it'll expand into the soil. Sometimes it actually does harm and stunts the growth of the tomato. So early is not good. Wait till the soil has warmed up enough and then late is not bad. So in a lot of gardening, that's a good principle to go by. So you can do a lot of harm by doing things too early in gardening, 
not too much harm and usually even better if you wait till later. So the procrastinators among us, the um, too busy <laughs> to do things on time, um, usually a couple weeks late is fine. A couple weeks early can be uh, damaging sometimes. So you have the choice for planting your tomatoes in a raised bed in the ground or in containers like earth box type containers where they're self-watering for you. Um, in any of these situations in the soil, you want to make sure that you're planting in soil that's healthy, that has not had diseased tomatoes in a previous year, um, at least the last three to five years. So if this was your garden plot here and you had planted tomatoes in this section up here at the top, last year or the year before that or the year before that so three years prior you want to plant your tomatoes somewhere else at least 10 feet away for some of us with small garden plots that's going to be kind of tough so do the best you can to separate um, if there was tomatoes in this section uh, last year maybe i'll choose this section this year um, so Crop rotation is pretty hard in small space and home gardens, but we try to do the best we can. And if it was in a container and if there was any disease or, or other soil borne issues, then I'm going to switch out my soil entirely. Same thing if it was in a raised bed and something else in the nightshade family or another tomato was in it and had an issue. So other members of the nightshade family include uh, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers. So if any of those members of the family were planted in this section, say, then again, I want to be in another section, a new section of the garden or new soil in the container. So um, whether it's a tomato or any other member of the nightshade family, you want to be switching that out um, at least in every three year cycle. And then our final tomato basic is full sun. There's no getting around it if you want big, gorgeous fruit on your tomato plants, you need full sun. And the definition of full sun is a minimum of six hours of direct sunlight. Eight, if you can get it more in their summertime is even better, um, but minimum of six just for some nice cherry tomatoes. I would say a minimum of eight for some good sized salad or slicing tomatoes. And if you can have even more full sun, even better. So that's one of the toughest things I think for a lot of us in um, older neighborhoods with fully grown trees is to get that full sun. Um, what you might want to do is look into getting a garden plot or um, renting a space from a neighbor who might have full sun or a friend or relative who might lend you uh, one of their raised beds to grow tomatoes in um, just to have access to that full sun. All right, so let's go on to some planting tips. So. We're ready now, we've got our seedlings, we've got our plot ready, we've got our soil, and now we've brought home one of our seedlings from Homestead. So here's my little seedling in the pot. First thing I'm gonna do is, you can see in the camera here, inspect the lower foliage. And right here, it's kind of hard to see on the camera, but I can see that there was frost damage on the tips of this. So I'll try to show you that right there. So that's not going to repair itself. It's not gonna heal itself. So that's gonna go bye-bye right away. So I'm gonna dispose of that. So I have this length of stem right here. And when I plant the tomato, I'm going to plant it at this level. The soil is gonna be right here. Anything below that needs to be pinched out. So I'm pinching out all that lower foliage, literally pinching with thumb and forefinger, that lower foliage, and I'm gonna bury the stem of the tomato all the way up just a little bit below that top foliage. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna send out roots everywhere there's a growth node below the soil level, and that's gonna help it be a stronger, healthier tomato plant. So if there's any flowers or tomato fruits on, a, on this plant when I bought it, I'm also going to pinch those out. I know you're like, no way. I'm not going to sacrifice those started tomatoes and flowers, but it's going to help your plant get established, send out roots, and put its strength and energy into being a strong, healthy tomato plant rather than getting those tiny little fruits or flowers that are on it already. 
to grow and form. So you want it to send its energy down into root formation to get a good strong plant and not do that. So we're gonna bury it up to here. Another trick we can do if we don't have enough real estate in our plot is to lay the tomato plant on its side in a trench and then place it like this. So the soil level is on its side and just bend it very gently so it's emerging. So that's another way to have lots of rootlets down uh, the whole stem length. So this other thing that I'm gonna do right when I plant my tomato plant is I'm putting the stake in at the same time. So we'll pretend this pen is my stake. So it's gonna go a couple inches and in back right at the same time as I'm planting it. And then I take my plant label and I put it not against the stem of my tomato, but I put it against the stake. So I always know the plant label is right there against the stake so I can know later on what tomato it is and it's not gonna rub and interfere with the stem of my tomato plant. So that's my tip for getting your label not to be lost later on because that does happen a lot. And putting the, the support in at the same time as planting is very important because you don't wanna come back later and stab in a trellis or support or one of those stakes and put that straight through the new plant roots that have just formed that you've worked so hard uh, to get a healthy plant. So we'll do that at the same time and have that long stake ready for it to grow up um, from the second you put it in the ground. All right, so our next tip for fertilizing the tomato. So we're gonna wait. We're not gonna fertilize immediately. We're gonna let that tomato seedling settle in, give it a couple weeks to expand its roots, get its bearings. And then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna sprinkle some Espoma tomato tone around it. And I'm literally gonna scratch like with one of those weeder or hoe um, uh, gardening tools or just the tip of my trowel, scratch around the surface, around where the root zone is of the tomato and then sprinkle in that tomato tone. Um, then when I see that the tomato plant has started to flower and is beginning to form tiny tomatoes, then I'm gonna come with a fish fertilizer and add a cap full of that when I'm watering. So that's a cap full to like a gallon or so of water. And then we'll talk about watering in a second. So watering, <laughs> you are going to water daily for the first two weeks. So the first two weeks that I put this little guy in the ground, it's gonna get a daily dose of water. And then after that, we're gonna wait to see the rain. So if we get one inch of rain a week, then I don't need to water so much. If we don't get an inch of rain a week, then you're gonna to need to give it supplemental water. And uh, the biggest advice I can give you, if anything else from this talk today, is that we're gonna water the root zone, not the leaves. So I'm showing you here in this picture what not to do. So she's out here with the hose and she's just drenching these tomato plants from the top. So we wanna go back and I'll show in the previous slide, we are gonna do a gentle rain of water around the root zone. Um, that means you might have to get down on your hands and knees sometimes. That means you might have to hold up the tomato foliage to get down there. But if you have a long nosed um, watering can, that's the best way to get it and get it to soak in in the root zone. The reason we don't want to water the foliage is because that introduces fungal and other disease issues. And then when you're splashing water on the ground, you're splashing back um, uh, anything that would splash onto leaves like early blight, late blight, and some of the wilt issues. So we'll talk about those in a few minutes. The other thing we can help the plant retain moisture, cut down on weeds, and also cut down on that splash back of the spores from early blight and other issues is to mulch. So in that first slide I showed you, we used a straw, just a little bit of straw around the tiny seedling, but then I'll come back with some composted material. You could use something like uh, leaf grow or bloom, um, soil amendments, or you could use um, your own homemade compost just to mulch around that stem. You could even use shredded 
um, hardwood, bark, any type of organic material just to be on that root zone. And it's gonna keep the soil a little cooler for the tomatoes. It's gonna keep in the moisture, keep down the weeds again, and then also hopefully prevent that splash back of some of the disease spores onto the lower foliage. All right, so your tomatoes growing, it's developed. So now when you're harvesting, uh, a couple of tips about that. So you wanna harvest your tomatoes, especially the larger tomatoes, the slicing or sandwich sized tomatoes or salad tomatoes, just when they start to show a blush of color. And then you can ripen them on your kitchen counters. A lot of people have different tricks and tips they use for getting tomatoes to ripen faster. Um, there's been a lot of research done as the best way to do it, but most people just say room temperature on your kitchen counter is fine. Some people like to put them in a sunny window. Some people put them in a brown paper bag. Um, you don't need to do any of that. Just um, put it on your tabletop or kitchen counter at room temperature and not in your refrigerator, not near bananas or other um, ripening fruit. Um, and you want to do that for a couple reasons. And that's first because creatures, and we'll talk about pests in a few minutes, are also looking at your beautiful tomatoes and might get to them first. So if you have had a lot of issues in the past of other creatures getting to your uh, tomatoes first when they're fully starting to ripen, you might just want to grab them and bring them inside to finish that ripening process inside your house. Um, and the other reason is just to have it handy. So um, sometimes we forget and then You've got tomatoes falling off the vine and maybe you're only able to get out to your kitchen garden or your community garden plot a couple times a week or even once a week. So this gives you some ripening inside that you don't have to act, always head out to the garden and grab some more. So the other thing I always recommend is, is if you're not able to keep up with the fresh tomatoes or you just have a great harvest that you can or freeze them, um, as soon as possible. So you can capture that fresh tomato taste and have that all year round. So you can flash freeze them, you can can them, you can do tomato jams, which is my little recipe here, which I'll put up a link later on Facebook for that tomato jam. And it's like, hmm, it's really, really good. It's a savory jam, not a sweet jam. Um, so I think you'll really enjoy that. Of course, you can make your own tomato sauces. Um, or um, share your tomatoes with your neighbors. <laughs> so just make sure you're using up all those great tomatoes because we all know it's a short season of harvesting and enjoying tomatoes, but we look forward to that all year round of having fresh from the garden tomatoes. All right, so let's talk a little bit about troubleshooting on our tomatoes. So one of the more common issues and one of the easiest to solve is cracking or cat facing. So that's a cat facing here on this orange tomato. And then on these cherry tomatoes, you see how they're cracked down the edge. And this happens in other fruits too. This isn't just a tomato issue. This will happen on cherries in particular. So what's happening is the skins are swelling up because you're getting a torrential amount of water or rain um, over a couple week period and then they burst. So the way to cure cracking or cat facing is to have steady amounts of moisture. So not three inches one week and then zero the next, one inch the next week and then zero the next. So it's steady amount of moisture that's the key to prevent cracking or cat facing. So sometimes, you know, we have torrential downpours we might have big storms coming through and that's hard to prevent that at times, but as best you can, if you're the one hand watering your plants, make sure you're consistent on your watering. Um, drip irrigation can help with that or just measuring and making sure you're doing a gallon or an inch a week. Um, in addition, if it rains, you don't need to be doing that on top of that. All right, so our next um, common tomato issue is blossom end rot. And it's pretty ugly. <laughs> it looks like a giant brown bruise on the stem end of the tomato. And it's unsightly. It's still edible. 
And I was going to say that too about um, the cracking or cap facing on the tomatoes. These are all still perfectly edible. So you can just, if you don't like to eat this, cut around that and cut that out. So same thing with this cracking or cap facing. You can just cut that out and the rest of the tomato is perfectly fine to eat. Same thing with the blossom end rot. I would just come and cut that part off and the rest of the tomato is fine. So blossom end rot is an indicator of not enough calcium uptake in the tomato. So usually at this point, when you're developing the, the fruits and they are showing you blossom end rot, it's probably a little too late to add calcium that would count for the season. So just know that that's an issue in your soil. And if you'd had your soil test done earlier, you might've seen that you were low on calcium. So um, for next year, you might add more bone meal. You um, could add crushed up eggshells. The fish fertilizer helps to add calcium because it has ground up fish bones in it. Um, know that the eggshells, you can crush them up and add them in the planting holes when you're planting your tomatoes but there are some studies that show it can take about 10 years for those eggshells to break down and the calcium to be taken up into the tomato plants. So just know that it's not gonna be an immediate solution, but you'll be aware of it and know for future years that that's one of the issues in your, maybe your native soil or your raised beds that you might have. Right, let's go on to sun scald. So this one, pretty easy one to solve. And again, this tomato is still perfectly edible and fine. It just has these sunburnt shoulders to it. And what happens is your tomato might have a foliar disease or um, the top foliage hasn't filled out enough. And then we get several days of 95 degrees and full beating down sun. And yes, tomatoes can get sunburned just like us human beings. So uh, an easy way to solve that is just to throw a row cover or a tool or a thin fabric over it if you think that's going to be a problem for your tomatoes. Again, it's not going to kill the plant. It's still an edible tomato. It's just unsightly and people think, what's happening? Why are my tomatoes bleaching out like that? Um, I have actually seen <laughs> people put umbrellas in their garden uh, to shelter some of their um, tomatoes from the hottest, sunniest parts from like mm, 2 to 4, 2 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. I really wouldn't go to that trouble. Just be aware that this is what sun, sun scald looks like, and it's not a huge issue. It's not going to, again, kill the plant. It's just a little unsightly. All right, so next is tomato mosaic virus. This isn't as common um, as the three other problems I just showed you, but I wanted you to be aware of it. Um, so this is a cross disease that comes from tobacco and affects tomato plants. And what happens is, this is a tobacco leaf I'm showing you here, but it looks the same on tomato plants. It gets this kind of like stippling whiteness to it and it kind of looks cool so that's the mosaic of the virus so it kind of gets this white stippling or variegation on the leaf um, and it almost looks chlorotic like it doesn't have enough iron or something so uh, if you are a smoker if you chew tobacco that is how that usually is transferred to the tomato plant like you smoke a cigarette put it out and then you go and prune or tie up your tomatoes. So you're transferring some of that onto the plant. So if you do smoke, please don't do so around your tomato plants. And also if you handle tobacco products at all, wash your hands or wear gloves before you handle your tomato plants. So that's a little known cross-contamination, but pretty easy to fix. All right, so our next is the big group of wilts, blights, and fungal diseases. So these are the ones that are the most heartbreaking <laughs> because some years are just worse than others. Some years we just have a lot of heat, humidity, and moisture in the air, and that promotes a lot of fungal diseases and illnesses. And then other years we have very windy, dry, and um, not so wet years, and so you won't have it as much know that your plants, even if they look like this, 
even if they're totally defoliated, brown, dying foliage, they'll still produce fruits for you. So see, they're still green, um, yellow, and orange tomatoes, and even some red ones down here. So they'll still have fruits. They're just unsightly looking, and obviously not as many fruits and not as robust as they would without the foliar diseases. So um, we talked a little bit about preventing some of those um, like early blight, late blight, fungal disease wilts and spores from splashing onto the leaves. So most of those are soil borne diseases. And you'll see here that they're using a black plastic to try to keep that down and still didn't work for these plants. Sometimes it's just a matter of they came with the plant from the grower and you started off with early blight and it just progressed on the plant. So sometimes it's nothing you can do. Sometimes again, it's in the soil or it's splashback, but try to be as hygienic as possible. Try to again, move your crop around and try to water just the root zone and not have splashback onto the leaves. And when I say hygienic, I don't care if you take a shower, <laughs> but around your tomato plants, try to make sure any foliage that drops down on the ground is cleaned up immediately. Um, any rotting fruit is cleaned up. And as soon as you start to see foliage die back like this, go in and snip it out, pinch it out, gather it up in a trash bag and throw it away. Do not put it on your compost pile because that's another way you can introduce uh, diseases to your tomato plants is by having those fungal spores in your compost pile, didn't heat up enough to kill them, and then composting with them around the plant and reintroducing it back into there. So you never want to compost this diseased material. You just want to get rid of that and put that in the landfill. All right, so we're going to talk really quickly about pests, and then we'll take our Q&A break. So, you know, pretty heartbreaking. <laughs> You've grown beautiful plants, beautiful tomatoes, and then you go out to your garden, and this is me turning over one of my tomatoes to find that somebody took a big bite out of that tomato. So um, there are a couple of tactics we can use. Of course, we can, as we said earlier, pick them as they start to ripen on the vine and then bring them to finish ripening inside. Um, we can also make sure to have, again, good garden hygiene. So no fruits hitting the ground because um, that does attract rodents to your garden. So make sure that everything is out of reach and up on the vine. Um, so a lot of the cases when birds and squirrels in particular are pecking at your tomatoes and they like carve out, sometimes you'll see it like it just looks like an empty hole, like they've scraped out your little cherry tomatoes they're doing it for the moisture. And it's usually in late July and August when their water sources are not as available. So it helps to provide um, fresh water somewhere nearby, but not in your tomato bed, but somewhere nearby so that they will go for that moisture and won't go for the moisture of your tomato fruits. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, red hot, Web, a red hot pepper wax spray. So that is a food grade wax, the same wax that you see like on cucumbers and apples at the grocery store. And it's permeated with red hot capsicum, red hot pepper, and you spray your tomato fruits as they're forming and it creates a seal over them. And then when a rabbit or deer or squirrel would come and take a bite out of that tomato, they would learn a lesson that that's burning hot on their throat and they won't come back and, and take a second bite. You need to make sure, of course, if you use that pepper spray, um, that wax pepper spray sealant on your fruits that, of course, you thoroughly wash them and use gloves when you pick them and bring them inside because you don't want to take a bite of that red hot pepper wax spray yourself. Um, and then the other way to prevent pests, of course, is exclusion by some type of wire fencing, chicken wire, um, hardware cloth, or maybe um, reme fabric or something that just prevents them from access to the tomatoes. All right, so we're going to jump into our Q&A section next, and I'm going to start 
with the Q and A on the webinar. And it says, do you prune your plants, Anne asks. So I only prune off any foliage that looks yellow, has any disease look to it, uh, might be turning brown. I don't thin out my foliage. There's a lot of different philosophies of pinching out uh, extra foliage or pinching out even extra flowers to get bigger tomatoes. So there's a whole um, hobby of doing that. I think it's making more work for yourself. I have tons and tons of tomatoes and I don't bother doing extra pruning. But again, if that's something you wanna try and experiment with, you could grow say three, oops, sorry about that three of the same type tomatoes and experiment with pruning one, leaving one alone, and then um, maybe leaving the third with nothing at all done to it and, and maybe not even fertilizing it just to experiment with how much fruit you get off of each one. So that'd be a fun experiment to do. All right, I'm gonna move on to the chat and I'm gonna scroll back to make sure I'm not missing anybody's questions earlier. Um, all right, so let's jump to where we are in our time frame. Do you recommend a stake or a cage? I personally like the one long stake, uh, especially for indeterminate tomatoes. So we didn't talk about determinate versus indeterminate. Um, that's gonna be in our next talk when we talk about uh, the next half when we talk about favorite types of tomatoes. Uh, basically the difference is indeterminate keep on growing. They're vining tomatoes, so they keep on going and going. Determinate stop at a certain point and create like a shrub or a bush. Um, so determinant is a lot easier just to attach to a stake and um, you could lasso on another stake to make it higher if it's indeterminate. Um, Determinant also easier to keep inside a small cage. Indeterminate can kind of get beyond the cage size and get all sprawly and wrangly. And if you look at how the natural tomatoes grow, although there's few of those out there, um, they're really scramblers. They like to grow across the ground and scramble over things. So they are vining plants that would love to climb and go wherever they want to. So your job as a gardener is just to guide it back and to attach it to your trellis, your support, your cage. Really, it's a matter of um, what you can fit in your garden and also what you like as far as neatness. I'm a little bit uh, messier in my garden, so I don't mind a little bit of tomatoes leaning one way or the other or going outside their, their bounds. Uh, one tip I did want to give on using supports or tomato cages is to use a flexible tie. So not to use wire or um, a hard string like, uh, say, dental floss or something. So I use like old pantyhose cut into strips and you can use some type of more flexible like um, hair pulls, I use old scrunchies sometimes. So something with give to it, because what happens is you strap it to the support and the winds can whip it back and forth. And if it's wire or something hard, it rubs against the stem and can snap it on you in a storm. Um, so I like something with a little more give. All right, I just saw, I think, uh, da, 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 da. yep. So we've got another question coming in and let's see, is it too late to add calcium now if you just planted the seedlings? No, I would say go ahead and in the tomato tone, there will be some calcium there. If you want to add a handful of bone meal or something in the planting hole, if you haven't planted yet, um, you can do that. You can also scratch it around the root zone surface um, like I told you, I do with the other fertilizer is just scratch a bit in, in the um, root zone area. So right around it. So when you water it in, it will percolate down to the root zone. All right. Patricia says, if you buy your plants and they already have tomatoes on them, is that okay? Yes. So um, it's okay if they already have producing tomatoes, but as I said, it's best practice to remove those tomatoes and flowers and to start, um, fresh because you want it again to concentrate on root growth and not on fruit development when it's first planted. Um, and I know 
I know it's tough to sacrifice those baby fruits because you're like, I got some already on there. Yay. Um, and let's see, Amelia says, what should the soil pH be? So tomatoes like slightly acid, but really um, most of our native soils are just fine. I wouldn't fool too much with adjusting the, the pH of our soils. Okay, so Homestead says, on the subject of pruning, should you cut off the top when it gets to the top of the cage to keep it from getting too high? No, you can pinch it back and you can prune it back, but I, again, like to let it keep growing. So it depends on the variety. So if it's a cherry tomato and it's going to be vining and going, that's fine. Um, if I want the plant to concentrate on developing, say, large heirloom sandwich salad size tomatoes, then I might, but I'm not going to like just chop off the top. What I might do is, let's see if I can show you on this little seedling. Okay, there's the growing point right there. I could pinch out, and it's very hard to show. Let's see if I can do it from the side. Pinch out this little top growth and encourage it to send side growth. So let's see if we can show you on camera there. Just pinch out that little triangle at the top. All right, so on this, let's see, we've got a few more questions. What are the best ways to give physical support to big indeterminate plants? I found sun golds to be especially unwieldy. Yes, Beth. <laughs> yeah, those could be like rangy monsters. So that's why I was saying that tomatoes really, um, their natural habitat is to be vines that just go over things. So I like to use, um, for those type of tomatoes, I'll have the support in the middle, and then I'll put a couple supports to the left and right, a couple feet apart. And as it starts to go out, up and out, then I will attach them to those. So I'll give it a little bit of time to grow up and then just the weight of all those sun gold fruits especially can and make it hang down and be in the soil. So I like to get it lifted up so it can have great air circulation and um, prevent a lot of those fungal issues. So yeah, good idea to have a couple extra supports on hand um, to keep it up. And then of course there's um, the square tomato cages are good for that too. So ones that you can install over the little seedling and then guide it up and through uh, once the tomato is starting to grow up. Let's see. James is asking about what about pinching out suckers, the shoots that grow out from the corner formed at the stem of the branch. Okay, so I was going to see if there's a sucker here to show you all. Let's see if I can turn this guy around. So there's a little sucker. Oh, this is hard to show right there on camera. It's hard to see my hand behind it right there's a little sucker in the corner um you can pinch it out which i'm doing right there and there's another one right here and that one's a little bit easier to see if you if i can put my hand behind it so there's a couple different philosophies and there's some research on that that shows you don't need to bother <laughs> so um really it's a matter of your personal taste uh they have not shown any difference from the amount of fruit and the quality of fruits that are on a tomato with having the sucker left on suckers left on or not um so i tend to if i see large more larger ones once the plant is grown up somewhat i will pinch them out just for increasing the air circulation if nothing else but i don't bother um, going around and trying to find every sucker and remove it. Okay, so Mary says, is it a good idea to keep branches off of the lower part of the trunk, say like up about a foot above the ground? Yes. So Amelia, that's a great tip. So again, for air circulation and for the splashback prevention of spores, I would say once your tomato is about say two feet or so high, you can go and take off some of those lower limbs and foliage down about, you know, less than six inches for sure. Um, and then even limit up a little bit higher later on. Um, so that should help it a lot. And Kathleen says, is using a, uh, in using an earth box, do I need to replace all the soil every year? Yes. So if you had a tomato 
or another member of the nightshade family. And again, that's eggplant, potato, peppers, and tomatoes in the nightshade family. If those were in that soil last year, then you should completely switch it out. And that's not the case for other container garden growing, but that is the case for nightshade because you don't want to carry problems from one year to the other. Okay, so another question coming in from I think Facebook, any advice for growing tomatoes in wicking buckets? So are those the buckets that hang that have like the wicking strip in there? Um, that you just want to keep a, a really close eye on the moisture level because it can dry out so quickly, especially you know, if you go away for a summer weekend, so you might want to have a neighbor or somebody else check on those for you. Um, I find them to be kind of gimmicky, actually. I think just putting them in the ground or a large container is a better idea for, for most tomatoes. Um, Hollis asks, do you have an opinion on cloth bags instead of pots? I'm a deck gardener, so need some container. So the cloth bags he's talking about are the grow bags that are kind of like a thick felted material. Um, those can be great. I only have a concern sometimes that the bottom of them, if they're sitting directly on the ground or say on a concrete pad or patio, that they can start to hold too much moisture on the bottom so and then start to rot um, or hold in and rot the roots that are down there. So I would put them up on like a piece of couple pieces of block, like this little piece of block here, just to make sure it's fully draining out the bottom. Um, even a couple pieces of brick down below is fine, but do go bigger in the grow bag than you think. So maybe at least a gallon size per um, one tomato plant. All right, so we talked about pinching out the shoots already um, with the city container with water always on the bottom of the container, can you overwater the plants? Yes, so if it's like a self-watering container um, and we get rain on top of it, wicking uh, moisture from the bottom, that could be an issue, so you wanna hold back on that. So in those cases with those self-watering containers, you also wanna just do the finger test and put your finger down into the soil a couple inches out from the stem and feel. So that way you'll know, is it actually moisture at the root uh, level or is it just looking dry on the surface? Because sometimes it can just fool you because it looks really dry on the surface, but there's plenty of moisture inside. All right, that's my little alarm, but I'm gonna let that go. Um, hmm. Okay, she says, Jackie says she can only see the coffee cup. Um, she's not seeing me talking. So we'll, we'll try to amend that later. Um, if you, go to participants and you see me talking, I'm waving right now, and you put your um, mouse, your cursor over my picture as I'm talking, three dots should show up on the right. Click on those three dots and you can hit pin. And then I will be up there hopefully in your right hand corner as well as the slides. So hopefully that helps you. Different Zoom technology has different um, ways, but usually the pin works for most people. Okay, so let's see, we got another question saying, what are good crops for testing, um, testing years for the nightshades? Oh, resting. Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> okay, so you're asking for in between growing the nightshades, what should you put in those other beds? So um, anything that's in the nitrogen fixing families. So those could be beans would be a great choice. You could also do um, uh, peas in the springtime and the fall in those same beds. You could do um, some cover crops of like say winter rye um, in between. And I tend to do my herbs. So like a woody herb the year after I put tomatoes in a bed. So the next year I might put my rosemary, my sage, that sort of thing in the bed because they're not as heavy feeders and tomatoes are such heavy feeders and so hungry for soil nutrients that they've sucked up so much of it that I want something 
that doesn't need that much nutrient in it. And that's a lot of our Mediterranean or woody, woody herbs like sages again and rosemary. Um, and again, the nitrogen fixing plants like beans and peas are a great choice for the in-between years. Uh, Karen replied, we can get a five gallon bucket. Okay. My neighbors tell me to put a handful of 10, 10, 10 fertilizer in the hole when planting thoughts. And James asked that. So again, I'd rather have the plant settle in, um, expand its roots and not be under stress of having excess fertilizer thrown at it at that point and then adding the fertilizer afterwards. So usually what you're doing is either stressing it by fertilizing it at that point or it's ignoring the fertilizer and then you've just wasted fertilizer. So um, save yourself the money and the effort. All right, uh, let's see. And I think I saw a, Q, a few more in the Q&A pop up and then the rest will catch up at the end so we can talk about our favorite types of tomatoes next. So Kathleen says, when using earth box, we asked, we answered that about the soil change out. Oh, what about tomato hornworms? Asked Debbie. So yes, <laughs> there are such thing as tomato hornworms. They look like big, fat, juicy, green caterpillars. Um, you just want to go early in the morning and pick them off. And we say hand pick doesn't mean you you have to do it with your bare hands. You can go out with gloves on. Take a container like a old jar full of soapy dishwater and knock them into that container, put the lid on and you're drowning your tomato hornworms. So the best thing is to hand pick them as soon as you see them first thing in the morning when they're slow and not active. Uh, Mike asks, what do you think about grafted tomatoes? Oh, good, good question, Mike. So I have trialed several grafted tomatoes. And for those who don't know what grafting is, grafting is taking the root section of a strong type of tomato variety. So it could be a disease resistant, uh, great tomato, but I'm going to graft my new type of tomato that's not as disease resistant, maybe not as strong onto those strong root zones so I can have super strong roots and then have this maybe a little more finicky, maybe not as healthy tomato growing on the top um, to, to have that as support. So there's grafting of fruit trees, that's pretty common. There's grafting of um, some of our ornamentals as well, like our ornamental cherry trees are often grafted onto stronger root stock in the bottom and have a beautiful um, selection on the top. With the tomato grafting, uh, they've done fine for me. I've trialed them side by side and I wouldn't say I would go out of my way to get a grafted tomato, but they certainly um, have done fine for me. And I didn't notice pretty much any difference in disease resistant between the grafted and the non-grafted tomatoes. Um, if you want to experiment and graft yourself, that's a fun thing to try and do. Um, I would say that it's something that you can experiment with, but again, I wouldn't pay extra for it. How's that for an answer? <laughs> so, um, I would just pick varieties that are more disease resistant, um, already in their breeding stock. Um, rather than go for breeding or grafting onto the um, more disease resistant stock that you would introduce. Okay. Do you have any experience with using Job's tomato spikes? Um, so Job's tomato spikes are those little fertilizer sticks that you stick in around the root zone and they're slow release. So that's a great choice for somebody who you might be too busy, you might forget to fertilize when you're watering the tomatoes over the season. So not a bad choice. If it's formulated for the tomatoes, then it's perfectly fine. And you wanna make sure, uh, I'll use this little guy as a demo again in the camera, that when you stick the tomato job spike in, you do it a couple inches out from the stem, not against or near the stem. So you wanna do it in the root zone uh, about a couple inches out. All right, so I'm going to go talk about our tomato varieties and then we'll catch up on the rest of the Q&A at the end because I don't want you guys to miss the tomatoes <laughs> that we're going to talk about today. So uh, first, I just want to say that 
uh, Washington Gardener magazine, we hold an annual tomato taste at the end of every summer um, at a local farmer's market. And so a lot of these favorites have come from these tomato tastes and what people have voted on at our tomato tastes. Of course, in 2020, because of COVID, we couldn't have our tomato taste, but we're hoping to have it back in 2021. So look out for announcements about that. Um, so what we do is we get farmers grown tomatoes from the markets and then we have boxes of toothpicks and you come with your toothpick and you taste one and then you get a new toothpick and you taste another so we want to keep it super sanitary and everybody has their individual bite of tomatoes um, so this is just a display of some of the ones that have been previous entries in some of our very enthusiastic tomato judges it's a super popular event and um, I encourage everybody to have a tomato taste at home or with neighbors or at your community garden because it's really fun to see the subtle differences in flavors. And it's also interesting to see people's different palates. Like I tend to like the more sugary tomatoes, the ones with the high sugar content and less meaty tomatoey flavor. And others are the complete opposite. They want that really bright tomato flavor and less sugar. So it's really interesting also to see how sometimes our, the voting comes in and how it splits. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some of the tomato varieties that are available at Homestead or that you might start from seed or try out. So um, the first tomato that I suggest everyone grow in their garden is Roma Plum. Um, similar to that is San Marzano and the Amish Paste. So these are big, plum shaped tomatoes, so like a big oval. And that those are usually determinant tomatoes, meaning more bush type tomato. And almost all the fruits will come on and ripen in one batch. So that way with a determinant tomato, you can have enough tomatoes at once to make a um, sauce with or to can or freeze and not have to just have a little bit at a time over the season as you do with indeterminate tomatoes. So that would be our first one choice. And then sorry for the darkness of this picture, but Cherry Q Purple is like a dark chocolatey brown tomato. Um, and that always ranks usually at our tomato taste in the top three. Um, so it's a really popular heirloom tomato um, that is just a really meaty tomato taste to it. <laughs> so if you really like that tomatoey side of the spectrum, then Cherokee Purple is for you. I also love how dramatically dark it is. So not really purple, I would call it more a dark burgundy, but it's pretty cool looking tomato. All right, and then we have Black Crim. So similar in looks to um, the, I'll go back to Cher Cherokee Purple, but it's more like a black shoulder and it has more of this division look to it that a lot of the old heirlooms get. And then if you see one of the slices down here, even the top of the slice inside the, the tomato meat inside has that dark shading to it. So really nice, meaty, full, heavy tomato. So if you're liking a tomato that makes a good sandwich tomato, a good thick slice on a sandwich, then black crim would be for you. All right, so we're now we're getting to some of our classic red tomatoes, like a full all around salad tomato for cutting up and that would be better boy. So this one is really disease resistant. Um, so I recommend that. I think this is coming out of some of the burpee breeding in Pennsylvania. Um, so this is a great one for all around use uh, in salads and at the table and also for disease resistance. All right, so now we have another similar tomato to the one I just showed you. There's Big Beef and Beef Masters. Um, and this one is bigger. <laughs> so uh, Better Boy, nice round, you know, heart-shaped almost tomato. If you like big, big tomatoes, Big Beef and Beef Masters are two choices for you. And these are if you want it to fill up with a slice, the entire slice of bread, right? <laughs> this is the one for you, or you just like to eat the tomato out of hand, then Big Beef or Beef Master is the one for you. All right, so Early Girl. This is a little bit smaller. I call this a salad-sized tomato, um, so like the size of a, you know, small gala apple, say, 
um, but it is one of the earliest of the full size tomatoes to come into ripening. Um, so some of us are super impatient and we wanna have tomatoes ASAP, say in early July or mid July, then early girl is the one you wanna start with. Um, most of the cherry tomatoes are the first to ripen for us. And we have to wait for some of the bigger tomatoes, but if you don't wanna wait, it's too long for those bigger tomatoes. Sometimes you have to wait till even into early September to get your first real big size tomato off of say the big beef or the beef master. Um, if you wanna get some nice red tomatoes earlier than that, then try a selection like early girl. All right, so Rutgers, this has placed in our top five for uh, taste tests at our tomato taste. And this is just besides disease resistant, great tasting, just an all around great all purpose tomato. Um, so it's also not as, I guess, what is the word for the inside? When you cut it open, it's not as juicy, it's more meaty. So it's one that I like a lot for use, um, say in a salad. Uh, so that one's the Rutgers and that's coming out of New Jersey, of course, hence the name Rutgers. All right, so this is a fun, fun selection, Matt's Wild Cherry. So I'm showing you here um, in the upper right. So this is a container of the Matt's Wild Cherry that I've picked from my garden. These are the Sun Gold Cherry Tomatoes. They're about the size of a quarter. So that gives you a little idea of the size of Matt's Wild Cherry. So they're more like a uh, dime sized and they are so fun to just pick off by the handful and just pop in your mouth right in the garden. Uh, they are a bit on the sweet side. If you like super sweet 100, if you like the other super sweet uh, cherry tomatoes, you're going to love Matt's Wild Cherry. Um, it's an extremely prolific tomato. It just keeps on coming and coming and coming all summer long, so much so that you're going to have a hard time keeping up with it, but it is worth it. And it's one of those tomato plants that you can just send out the little kids into the garden and just let them graze all day long on that Matt's Wild Cherry. Super, super yummy, almost like candy. All right, so our next uh, cherry tomato that I recommend is the Heirloom Yellow Pear. So this one is a classic and great to, to toss onto a salad or use in a pasta salad, cut up in half, or just to eat a snack on. Um, it's pretty uh, hardy in our area, and it's one of those that you can start easily from seed at home as well. Um, and I've even had it self-seed for me in the compost pile and come true. So I'm really a big fan of yellow pear for beginning tomato gardeners. So this is one of the ones that I would recommend if you don't have a ton of experience and want to have a tomato that's pretty easy and prolific, I would go with yellow pear. All right, so next are the Sun Gold and the Sun Sugar. Um, so Sun Gold was introduced and then a few years later, they're like, Sun Gold wasn't quite sweet enough. We're gonna make Sun Sugar even sweeter. And as I told you before, I love the sweet side of tomatoes. So I love both of these. Um, so here it is in our tomato taste. It has ranked one or two uh, in the tomato taste almost every year. It comes in first or second. Um, so people are in love with sun gold and sun sugar. It, it is like candy. It has hardly any tomato taste to it at all. So if you're not a tomato fan or you have some in your family who's like, mm, I don't really like tomatoes, give them sun gold. Don't tell them it's a tomato. It's a little yellow. Just tell them it's a yellow, little yellow berry <laughs> and they're sure to love it. Um, pretty disease resistant as well. Can get a little bit of some some of the early blight on it I've noticed, but still pretty good. And again, very prolific plant. And as we talked about during the Q&A, it can get big. It can take over a big section of the garden. So give it some space. All right, so green zebra. And this one is another one that usually makes the top five, if not the top three of our tomato taste every year. I think is one of our most beautiful tomatoes. So it has this yellow streaking to it, but it's, it, it is ripe when it's green like this. And the best thing about it is if you have animals that are waiting 
for your tomatoes to ripen to take a bite out of them, they tend to leave green zebra alone because they don't know it's ripe when it's still green. Um, and if you have human thieves, that can also um, deter them as well because they won't think it's actually ripe. But it is, you just have to feel a tomato and when it starts to give a little bit, the flesh gives almost like with a mango or other or a pear, when you start to feel it soften a little bit, then you know it's ready to pick and it's fully ripe and it has a nice mellow flavor to it. So if you like a nice mellow tomato uh, to cut up and eat just the slices straight from off the tomato, um, then green zebra is a great one. Plus it's beautiful. All right, and a new variety I trialed uh, last year in my garden is apple yellow. And that is about the size of, um, I would say like a tube of lipstick, but it looks like a small yellow pepper. What's so cool about apple yellow is it's almost hollow inside. It has hardly any of uh, the wet fleshy part or seed to it. So it's super easy to cut in half and use to like as a little tiny stuffer for an appetizer, like putting some cream cheese in it. Um, it's great for snacking. I also found that it was great for putting in a dehydrator and drying like a sun-dried tomato because it's a really thick skin and meat to it and hardly any of the fleshy part, the, the um, wet parts to it, that it dries very quickly and easily and makes a great sun-dried tomato selection. And uh, maybe I'll scroll back to the beginning of the way beginning of the talk to show you again what the apple yellow looks like, but I can't say enough about apple yellow. And it is also another one of those very prolific uh, cherry tomatoes. All right, so I'm going to ask for any favorites I missed. You can put them in the Q&A and recommend your favorite tomatoes and or put them in the comments on the Facebook Live. And since I can only give a top 12 here, um, you're welcome to come to our tomato taste and taste some of the ones I've shown you there and maybe contrast and see hmm, maybe I have a new favorite because that happens a lot at our tomato tastes. Like somebody will come and swear they don't like green tomatoes and they taste green zebra and they change their mind. Um, so uh, really quickly to give you some background of tomato growing, uh, we have Washington Gardener Magazine where we talk about new introductions and tomato growing tips and the new research all the time. I recommend um, talking to your neighbors. If you're at a community garden, compare your tomatoes with each other and see how you're doing. If one of you is getting early blight, then let the others know because it can spread uh, by windborne spores. So definitely check out and look out for each other if you're neighboring uh, people are growing tomatoes as well. Uh, there are some great out of print local garden books that were published by the Washington Post and the Washington Star and the Montgomery Men's Club that are great resources for local gardening. Uh, check with your local public gardens and see what type of tomatoes they're growing and, and how well they're doing. Join Facebook groups like DC Gardeners, Homestead Gardens page, Washington Gardener has a page and compare and contrast with other local gardeners on social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And this is my contact information here. So our website is washingtongardener.blogspot.com. You can find me on social media at WDC Gardener on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. On Facebook, it's just Washington Gardener Magazine, all one word. Uh, our podcast, Garden DC, comes out every Saturday. And last year, we had two tomato theme episodes. One was on um, new small introductions of tomatoes, so basically container-sized tomatoes, and another episode was all about heirlooms and favorite heirloom tomatoes, so you might want to check out a couple of those tomato episodes from last year, and if you enjoyed my talk today, I'd love a review on greatgardenspeakers.com. And I am going to scroll back all the way to the beginning of the slideshow to show you the apple yellow again on that plate. There it is. So this again is the apple yellow at the top. This is a sun gold. And then this is a cherry red pick down here, the red ones. So that gives you a kind of bit of the, the size 
comparison of these different type of cherry tomatoes and that apple yellow is a little bit bigger but it's also kind of a hollow cool tomato so you'll be seeing that more in, in your local garden center like homestead in in coming years all right so now we're gonna go back over to the q a um somebody says they love mortgage lifter yes <laughs> I do too. I like I like to look out for that at my local farmers market. And there's such a cool story behind Mortgage Lifter, right? Um, and there's a lot of different folklore about it that you know different stories have come up over the years. So it's just a fun name, fun tomato, and and great tasting as well. So Beth says she loves Eva purple balls. They have a wonderful flavor and smooth texture. Yeah, texture is really important in tomatoes, right? So sometimes you have like a firm tomato, like that apple yellow, like it feels like you're biting into a pepper or um, an apple even, that hence the name apple yellow. And sometimes when you take, you bite into a sun gold, it kind of just has that burst of flavor in your mouth. And then sometimes tomatoes can kind of be mealy, right? And have that like mealy texture to them if they were not properly raised or they were raised in a greenhouse. So yeah, tomatoes can have different texture and that's a really important facet of the experience of eating is that texture. Um, so Eminem is asking the best way to freeze tomatoes. So um, I tend to do the flash freeze technique and which is you blanch the tomato skin and all and then cut them in half or lay them out on cookie sheets and then put them in the freezer for an hour or a couple hours and then make sure they're frozen solid and then throw them all into freezer bags. So I'm just quick flash freezing them um, by that technique. And then they're individual in their, when you put them on their cookie sheets. So if you were to freeze them all in a bag together, they would be clumped up. So that's why you do the cookie sheet first, then take it out and put it into freezer bags. And that way you can grab a couple handfuls to throw like into a recipe or stir fry later on. Okay, so that was in the Q&A. So now I'm gonna check the chat. And um, do you cut the apple yellow before dehydrating? Yes, so what I did was just sliced it exactly in half and then laid them uh, with the open side up and I sprinkled garlic salt or garlic powder, sorry, not garlic salt, don't do that. <laughs> garlic powder, uh, just a light sprinkle of garlic powder to give them a little bit of a flavor to them um, in the dehydrator. And I had them in the dehydrator about, I think it was five hours total. And you could do the same thing on an oven at very low temperature if you don't have a dehydrator on hand. Um, so Arthur says he likes chocolate sprinkles. I have not tried chocolate sprinkles, Arthur. I'm going to have to try that one just for that name because I love chocolate. Who doesn't love chocolate? <laughs> and chocolate sprinkles sounds like a wonderful tomato. Um, Arthur, let us know uh, a little bit more about uh, chocolate sprinkles. Is it a cherry size, I'm going to assume? Um, so that sounds really good. James says, everyone I know says that 2020 was a terrible year for their tomatoes. I experienced that as well. Did you experience that as well? James, 100% 2020 was not a good tomato year because we had lots and lots and lots of rain. Um, so it was uh, a great year for fungal diseases and a great year for cracking. So that's where I got a lot of my pictures that I showed you here today. And uh, it was just, you know, a long wet summer. And we usually have July, about mid-July through August in the Mid-Atlantic is our dry season. And tomatoes don't need that much water, like we said, an inch a week after they, they're established. So they actually do like it a bit on the hot and dry side. And that helps again with the fungal and disease issues and to develop really good tasting fruits. You need a lot of good sunlight, right? They just suck in that sunlight and it's almost like you're eating the sun in uh, side a tomato skin. Um, so of course also weather could be a factor, the ups and downs, and then the soil can be a factor. So just like it affects the taste of wine grapes, the different soils we use or different soils we have um, from one bed to another or from one garden, somebody will say, 
you know, my tomatoes tasted different when I was growing them in North Carolina or New Jersey uh, versus when I lived in Ohio. So that can all affect the taste of the tomatoes too. So yeah, if last year, 2020 was your first year ever growing tomatoes and you didn't have much success, do not blame yourself. It was 2020. It was just not a good year for tomatoes. All right, so let's see a new message from, uh, let's see, that's coming through from Facebook. How to grow tomatoes for climate change, <laughs> all right? So uh, they like it hot and uh, dry. So depends on how it goes, right? Depends on how climate change will manifest itself, but probably tomatoes are not gonna be an issue <laughs> for that. Um, so they'll probably adapt pretty well, probably better than we will adapt to that. I'm gonna scroll backwards through the chat because I felt like I missed a few. Um, how to treat other bugs like aphids and insects. And since tomatoes don't pollinate, do you have to force pollinate between blooms to get more tomatoes? So uh, if you're not getting good pollination on your tomatoes, so maybe the bees are just ignoring it or something, you can hand pollinate. You could take a um, little watercolor brush or tiny paint brush and take pollen and shake it off from one onto another. So you can certainly do that. I just try to encourage bees around my tomato plants by planting a lot of marigolds in the vicinity and other um, flowering herbs like borage that attracts pollinators. I also like to have cosmos and celosia nearby my tomatoes. So all of those attract pollinators to my garden and then they move on to the tomatoes. So I don't find that pollination is usually a big issue, but again, you can hand pollinate with a tiny like makeup brush or, or art brush if you want to. Um, and then she was, the previous question was about bugs like aphids. So um, in general, I like to let mother nature take care of itself. So if um, aphids start to attack one of my plants, usually ladybugs move in soon after that. And then birds soon after that, because where there's a food source, there's usually somebody hungry enough to eat it. Um, if it's to the point where it's causing damage to your plants, then you can take a strong spray on your hose, uh, just the adjustment on your hose sprayer and spray off the, the aphids with a strong jet of water is the, the best way to knock them off and take care of them. And like we talked about with the tomato hornworm, if you see, say, I don't know, uh, Japanese beetles or something else that might be impacting your plants, you can hand pick them off again and drop them into a jar of soapy water. Okay, so we so saw a few new things. Um, <laughs> so that I think hopefully that addressed the question about flying pests enough. I, I think um, chocolate sprinkles is a cherry tomato. Yay. So Arthur was telling us about the chocolate sprinkles. I figured it was a cherry tomato and it sounds like it's similar to some of the other chocolate ones. Don't we wish they actually tasted and smelled like chocolate, <laughs> but it's just because they have like that um, brownish black shoulders to them. So I'm popping back over to the Q&A and I see, I think it's Mike has asked, I've used paper towels to cover the soil and then a layer of straw to prevent any splash back from the garden soil. And that seems to work well. So that's a great tip, Mike. And yeah, that's why sometimes people will put that um, plastic or landscape cloth underneath and then put wood chips on top. So that's another technique you can use. There's like rolls of a dark red plastic tomato um, bed liner that you can use too. And you just kind of put it around the root zone, but not up the stem at all. Make sure the, the stem is free and clear and that it can still get water in there. Um, but yeah, some type of barrier is, is a good idea. I've seen also people put rocks like pebbles around and I just find that to be a uh, that will be later on a high maintenance issue to pick all those pebbles or rocks back out of the soil um, after you pull your tomatoes. Okay, I think we got to everything. Whoop. Oh, Mike says your tomato jam recipe. All right, so I will see if I can jump off the stop share and pull that up. But meanwhile, keep asking questions and I'll also share the link um, on the, the Homestead Gardens Facebook page for this event. 
as well as the whoa, details. There we go. As well as on the Washington Gardener page two. So let's see if we can get that. Okay. So, all right. We'll come back over with our link to our tomato talk and make sure I didn't lose you all. Okay. And what is your opinion about dry farming? So, MM, I'm not familiar with that term. Do you mean just not watering at all? Um, so I have heard of people who just don't water their tomato plants after they're established at all. And that is one way to go. And shockingly, uh, I've always been surprised at those garden plots that are near me at my community garden that don't water after July just because they go on vacation or life happens and they get busy. And then... <laughs> Uh, their tomatoes do just as well as my tomatoes. So there is something to be said about neglect and still having just as great a tomato out of that. Okay, so I'm just trying to pull up the, um, the tomato uh, for you. If I can get that link to come up, I think I can copy and paste it here. Sorry about jumping over. And I'm going to put it in the chat box for those who are on Zoom. And again, we'll copy it over to Facebook later. So basically, it's washingtongardener.blogspot.com. And then in the um, search field, just enter tomato jam, and that'll come up for you. Okay. I think we've got everything on the Q&A. Oh, Catherine asks, what about cicadas? Do I need to protect my plants? No, cicadas are not going to bother your tomatoes at all except for maybe resting on them, right? Because uh, they're looking for woody plants to deposit their eggs in. So they don't care about fleshy plants like tomato plants. They're looking for small trees with like pencil thickness to their branches. So like a small uh, dogwood um, or like a small cherry tree might be susceptible to cicadas putting their eggs in those branches, but they're not uh, going to impact your tomatoes at all. Um, all right, so Eminem says, yes, that's not watering your tomatoes after a certain point. So yeah, that's something you could experiment with. And last year, we've got so much extra moisture, like we talked about, that really you didn't need to supplemental water at all. But in dry years, I have seen people just stop um, uh, watering their tomatoes and have totally have success with that as well. All right. I hope that link works for everyone. So um, I think we're caught up on all the questions. And I just wanted to say uh, that I wish everybody great luck with this year's crop of tomatoes. Um, I encourage you to post pictures and let us know about your successes, maybe some varieties that did better than others, or maybe something that was a surprise to you, because we all get to learn from each other, and there are so many different great tomato varieties out there. We can't all grow them ourselves, so it's really nice to be able to um, learn and share and see what are some favorites out there, so happy tomato growing and happy almost summertime, right? Um, oop, James says the link is blocked. Can you provide the recipe? Yes. So if you email me, don't know why the link is blocked, but I will pop my, um, email into the chat box and I will read it out loud for those on Facebook. So it's Kathy Jentz, my name with a K, you can J E N T Z at gmail.com. And I will send the recipe directly to you. And Kathy, just to note that there's a great tomato jam recipe in the link I included on Facebook from the oh, Homestead perfect. Garden blog. Yay! And, and then I included another one from a local food writer who happens to be me. And, <laughs> um, and it's on there as well with some more recipes. Oh, perfect. Yep. So yeah, at the Tomato Taste, we, we have collected over the years some different chef at market recipes that we love as well. So I'll try to post those as well. But yeah, it's great to be able to share the different ones. And, and I tend to love some of those savory tomato jams, especially in the in the dead of winter, right? Like when you're all bundled up in front of the fireplace, it's, it's a great taste of summertime. So 
thank you all and happy gardening. <laughs>